Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts for this, Jamie Hopkins, joined by Devin, and really excited to have uh, kind of the, you know, kind of first guest in this interesting series we're doing all in retirement income planning, Dr. Richard Thaler, who probably for most people listening to this does not need an introduction, but we will talk a little bit about your work. And so really excited for you to join Devin and I here on the show today. Thanks, Jamie. Good to be here. Uh, so uh, I think most people probably that are listening to this, especially in the retirement income and personal finance space, are kind of aware of your work. But uh, and we'll kind of ask an icebreaker question here first. But I, I just want to start by saying thank you for your work and you know the impact that you've had out on retirees in this country and and abroad now too. So um, you know we're very appreciative of your time and, and for you joining us. But one of the things that we do like to ask it's an icebreaker is about food, and we were just talking about this before uh, cameras started rolling, but what's your favorite either type of cuisine or food or thing that comes to mind when you think about food? Yeah, we were just talking about that. I think if I had to eat in one country, it would be Japan, though uh, France and Italy would be close on the heels. Yeah. The I thought the really interesting thing, too, before you said that, is that it's not just sushi in Japan, too, which for people in America that haven't been there, that's probably what they think. Oh, you only eat sushi, right? Right. And uh, restaurants are very specialized. So if you want tempura, you go to a tempura place. You want sushi, you go to a sushi place. And, uh, so, yeah. Uh, the diversity is amazing. And they have seasons their seasons last two weeks <laughs> and the so the menus change with the season and i was at one uh sushi restaurant and they were serving salmon row and they were saying the key was you have to get the salmon when they're swimming upstream not downstream so yeah do, do you think that the decision framework there makes the restaurant decision better right I, I think there's some research shows like the cheesecake factory when you have too many decisions right you you have less confidence in what you ordered so you know does that steer into the factor there well i i always love uh you know what in japan they call omakase but uh just let the chef mm -hmm. make what he or she wants and bring it on so that's that's good all over the world. I love that you get a different experience every time you go because everything is changing so frequently. Right. So. Right. Well, let me ask you another question. You're you know you're you're a legend in this area, really. Um, you know, we've we've followed a lot of your research, and a lot of your research has influenced you know so much of the uh, of the behavioral re uh, finance research, and uh, you know some of the the strategies that we've put together. Why did you decide to get involved in this in the first place? What what is your why? behind the topic that you've chosen to pursue your whole career? Well, you know, when I started when I was in graduate school and uh, I was learning economic theory and it was based on, you know, you know, economists refer to the people, they never really call them people, they call them agents. And, and agents are these creatures that you only meet in economics textbooks and they're really smart they're as smart as the smartest economist and possibly as smart as the smartest economist thinks he is which is really smart <laughs> and um they have no self-control problems and no emotions and they don't care about anybody else possibly their family on a good day but otherwise no so, you know, I kept struggling with um, wh what are we talking about? And uh, gradually I started making a list of dumb stuff people do. And um, eventually, I, af after I graduated, I, I met uh, two psychologists who, who became my mentors Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And uh, we spent a year together at Stanford when it, they were there visiting from Israel. And I, I was there visiting from the East Coast. And uh, they taught me psychology and 
I taught them economics, and um, that's how I got started. It feels like that was kind of a big starting point, right? Of course, uh, you know, Kahneman and Tversky, the prospect theory, that was sort of what sort of disconnected us from the old kind of modern portfolio theory into something where we're starting to think of people as real people, right? And making, you know, decisions that are seem to be rational, but maybe not uh, on paper, uh, how we treated it in the past. So do you feel like that was kind of the starting point of, of well, this it, topic? it was certainly my starting point. And we had a year there, uh, we were all on sabbatic. And they were finishing the final draft of prospect theory they had uh, this is 1977 78 obviously i was about four years old <laughs> and um they th they had done their other work on judgment things like the availability heuristic and overconfidence and stuff like that but prospect theory was the big breakthrough into economics and uh after that year, I decided, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And I thought it was a highly risky. It was a startup, right? It was an academic startup uh, with very high variance. But it was fun. So why not? And this is, again, uh, still the, a research area that's still evolving. Uh, we were talking about some of the industry research evolving in some areas. I still feel like there's a lot yet to evolve in this area. I kind of have a theory that there you know, several more Nobel Prizes might come from this area of behavioral economics and behavioral finance and so forth. Uh, uh -huh. Am I crazy to think so? No, I think that's right. I mean, the field is new. Uh, you know, if it started in 1980, so it's only 40 years old. And uh, the and the behavioral approach to doing economics, it, it's quite surprising that it succeeded in finance early. Mm -hmm. um, that was the least likely place people thought that you could apply these ideas. Maybe marketing, not mm -hmm. finance. And um, so there were, there were lots of inroads in finance, as you know, but behavioral economists are now doing labor economics and macroeconomics mm -hmm. and um, essentially every field. But there, there are many of those fields where the work is just beginning and uh, the graduate students are there thinking. So, yeah, it, it's just starting. One of the things uh, you mentioned was this move away from the, the mythical agent that existed in research and textbooks. And I saw uh, an article, I think they talked about uh, your work and kind of how you humanized the economic side and were given some credit for that, which I think is a beautiful way to put it, right? Bringing the person back into it. Um, also, I, I think a couple of years ago, um, you know, a professor and Dr. Shlomo Benzari talked, he, you know, some of his research uh, showed, I think they credited some of your work with like 30 plus billion now that's probably in retirement savings, which is a pretty cool thing to step back and think about. Um, so when you think about that and the work from the nudge research and all of that work, it, like, does that seem like the impact there? Did you kind of expect all that to occur at the time? Or are you kind of impressed by the impact that it's had? You know, no, I never expected any of this. So, you know, if, if we go back to finance, the I wrote my first finance paper. It was published in 1985. And I wrote it because I had a graduate student Belgian guy called Werner de Bon who wanted to do finance. I said, okay, that sounds fun. So, uh, and he, he, uh, he had done a master's degree over in Belgium and was sort of ready to go. And we, we wrote this paper, does the stock market overreact? And it's a very simple idea. We just went back to the beginning of time in finance, which is 1926, <laughs> uh, because that's when the uh, crisp data, mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. of Chicago started collecting data going back to 1926. And we just, every five-year period, ranked the 35 stocks that went down the most and the 35 that went up the most. 
And then we saw how they did over the next five years. And then we'd move one year over and repeat that. And in the efficient market hypothesis, uh, which was, uh, the phrase was coined by my uh, friend and golf buddy, Gene Fama. Uh, the efficient market hypothesis predicts that those portfolios will do equally well because you can't predict the future from the past. And we kind of thought that the winners would go down and the losers would go up, and that was true. And um, the, the graduate students at the University of Chicago, where I'm now on the faculty, uh, were more or less given the assignment to find our programming error mm -hmm. because that was considered the most likely explanation <laughs> for the findings because they couldn't possibly be right. Yeah. So programming error was... So that was a surprise, and it got a lot of attention in finance. It made a lot of people mad. So I said, oh, let's do more of this. And... Um, you know, as for the nudge stuff, I didn't do anything with a hint of public policy mm -hmm. for 25, first 25 years or so, uh, in part because the field as an academic discipline was already controversial. And there were some people who... who uh, including a, a, another Chicago Nobel laureate, who I won't mention his name, um, who thought that behavioral finance was dangerous. And the reason why it was dangerous is it, he thought if you relaxed the assumption that stock prices are rational, then people are going to want to regulate financial markets. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't follow, but he, that was his worry. And so, uh, anyway, I just tried to stay away from that. <laughs> and it, like I say, what I was doing was already controversial enough. Um, but then I was, uh, the, in, the intellectual question that got me interested in retirement saving was uh, I was interested in the fact that people have self-control problems, which, again, is not a surprise to any human, but uh, does the words self-control cannot be found in any economics textbook. And the concept just doesn't exist. People choose what's best, full stop. And um, so if they have... Uh, five margaritas and two steaks, you know, that's because that was the wise choice that evening, uh, no matter how they feel the next morning. <laughs> um, so I started getting interested in that. And of course that leads, well, that maybe not of course, but anyway, that led me to think about the problem of retirement saving. Mm -hmm. And retirement saving... I mean, in hindsight, it's the perfect behavioral economics topic because it requires you to relax both of the key incorrect assumptions in economics, which is that people are really smart and really good at self-control, mm -hmm. right? Because figuring out how much you need to save for retirement is a hard problem. That's why people go to financial advisors. Um, and, you know, even professional economists will say it's a hard problem. Uh, you have to predict how much you're going to make and what returns you're going to get and how long you're going to live. And so it's hard. And then you have to have the self-control to put money aside and not spend it on uh, a sports car. So um, so anyway, that's yeah. uh, th th that was the intellectual issue. And the, the work with Shlomo Benarzi, um, 
That came about because um, I was supposed to give a talk at a conference sponsored by one of the large uh, mutual fund companies. And they asked me, you know, it was a talk where the there were a bunch of practitioners there, I probably financial advisors, I'm not sure. And um, they had asked me to talk about whether behavioral economics had anything to say about how you could help people save more for mm -hmm. retirement. And uh, so that's when I got the idea of gradually increasing the withdrawals mm -hmm. over time. And uh, Benarzi, who was another one of my graduate students, he and I worked on that together and we called it Save More Tomorrow. And I think that's what you're referring to with the 30 billion or whatever it is. I mean, that that idea spread around the world. There was an article in the FT last week uh, showing what that's done in mm -hmm. the UK. So yeah. that they started a defined contribution national retirement system. Um mostly for people who are working at a place that doesn't offer a pension. So there's also their version of social security. And the rule was companies that didn't offer a pension plan had to offer this and they had to, so that was mandatory. And then participants had to be automatically enrolled the second mm -hmm. leg of the uh, behavioral economics uh, toolkit for retirement saving. Um, and that was very controversial at the time. There were many people who thought it should be mandatory. Mm -hmm. But that's the way they did it. Um, only about 10% of people opt out. So the enrollment has worked very well. And they started people out at two or three percent, I don't remember, but then they've been increasing it over time and this graph in the FT shows how that's been working. And uh, so, yeah, the the idea is spreading. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that combination of the automatic enrollment and that escalation over time is, you know, kind of proven itself out now to work, right? Which is also yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah, that works. And, you know, we need something like that in the US because something like 40% of employees do not have a retirement plan where they work. Mm -hmm. And to a first approximation, if you don't have a retirement plan, you don't save. And so some states, including Illinois, uh, have started a version of that mm -hmm. and I think it, we should have a national version of that. I don't know why anyone is opposed to that, but as we know, it's hard to get Washington to agree on anything now. Um, so a few states have done this, and um, uh, if you live in a state that hasn't done it, um, you should encourage your state legislatures to get busy what, what kind of grade would you give like the asset management industry the investment industry as a whole however you want to define it uh, in terms of creating the choice architecture not not just the automatic enrollment but just designing the entire choice architecture to help people make better decisions well you know i referred to the three-legged stool the third part uh was the creation of sensible default investment mm -hmm. vehicles and this is something this is something we worked on back in the mid 2000s uh in the George W Bush administration the labor department at that time the only approved default investment vehicle was a money market account or stable value or various versions of that um nothing with equities and uh that was his 
President Bush's Labor Department, at the very same time, he was proposing that we partially privatize part of Social Security. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I kept pointing out, you know, these two things don't really add up. If you think everybody should be investing in stocks, then maybe you should let some people invest in stocks. And um, so a bill was passed that uh, included uh, Safe Harbor for that mm -hmm. and gave some blessing to the automatic enrollment and um, uh, automatic escalation. Uh, so having a good default is a good way to start. If you look at the history of these plans, they started out with only half a dozen options. And then number of options started increasing and that was not helpful. And uh, I've written a couple papers on what's happened in Sweden where they launched a plan that had 450 options, mm. which is preposterous. Um, so uh, when I joined the University of Chicago, we had every mutual fund offered by Vanguard uh, as one of as mm -hmm. the options, <laughs> except no um, tax-free municipals. They were smart enough at least to take those out since they make no sense in a retirement plan. But some people would have picked them if they were in there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, my wife, who she and I joined the University of Chicago at the same year, and she's looking at this and saying, how am I supposed to make a choice here? And, you know, here's a Ph.D., faculty member at the Chicago Business School who is trying to make sense of this and um, w what are normal people supposed to do. So I think having a sensible default is a great start. Um, obviously, all the firms have different versions of that and uh, we could have a very boring discussion of the, <laughs> of the mechanics of the uh, of the various formulas. But I think the key thing that that those plans do is they give you diversification and they automatically rebalance, which helps because the individual participants have a knack for buying high and selling low. I mean, if you look at what happened you know, like in 2000 or in 2008, uh, 401k participants were mm -hmm. dumping their stocks. And of course, those were good times to be buying. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I, I, I think the choice architecture has improved, uh, but mostly because most of the people take the default. And I don't think there's been that much progress on helping people create their own portfolio. Maybe, you know, this is what Bill Sharp was working on mm -hmm. back in the day with his firm, Financial Engines. But um, I, I, I think most investors are happy to just let somebody else do it. Well, you didn't, you didn't give a grade though, you know, you're as a professor, right? What, what Look, was the grade? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, as, as you know, I am a principal in a money management firm, yeah. so I have a conflict of interest. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and uh, cannot assign a grant. I was like, are you, are you sure you're not an attorney, too, with that answer? <laughs> <laughs> The uh, so you brought up a, a, a I'll shift this into something else, but I'll tell a story first too, which is the uh, default money market uh, in plants. And so my wife and I've told this story before, and she knows that I tell the story. She's not a huge fan of me telling it, but she's wonderful. So Kathy, if you're listening to this later, um, so when I met her, she had an old 401k plan that was from like one of her first jobs in the 2000s in New York. And I'm looking at this uh, thing, I'm looking at the total return kind of statement, and we we're just going to do a rollover. But I was like super confused by her statement because I was like, it says this thing is like, it's like 0.01% and you work there from like 2005 to 10 or something. And I'm like, should have been a really good time, <laughs> right? 
Well, she was in a money market account the entire time until like 13 when I met her. And I'm just sitting there being like, I don't, like I couldn't figure it out. And I just thought it had been liquidated into a money market for this rollover we were gonna do. And she told me then like, why did I pick it? Well, one, it was the default, but two, it said most conservative option. And she goes, I'm conservative. So I picked the most conservative option. And money market account by its name alone makes no difference than, you know, you know, growth portfolio, you know, whatever it was. So she ended up in that during probably one of the best times as a very young person to be almost 100% mm -hmm. in equities during a, now look, it wasn't a ton of money, but when you just think about that impact over the course of a life, and she's one of a million people that were doing very similar things during that time period, which is uh, to me, right, it's one of those things that we got a lot of stuff right, but there was still enough room for error in that design, right? Which yeah, is, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I want to shift this a little bit here to the retirement income side. So we kind of spent some time on the savings. And uh, I, I think one of the, that story leads us to, on the flip side, we, we have some automatic features now for the savings world. Now, when we get to the, you get to retirement, we don't really have a lot of options for people now in these plans where they've saved, they've accumulated money, they might have ended up in a target date fund, and we get to retirement and all of a sudden, hey, good luck. Right. Um, so where do you th what do you think from whether it's systems, policies, products, what do you think we need to help people move from that savings to the spending or decumulation side? Yeah. So it's a good question. And, you know, I was describing the retirement saving problem as hard. Uh, just the mathematical problem is hard. The the reverse is harder. Much harder. Because. If I'm 40 and I'm saving for retirement and I say, okay, maybe I'll aim to retire at 67. Well, I can get a financial advisor to run some numbers and we can, we can make some guesses. And then as we go along, we can adjust. Mm -hmm. And even... You know, if you're unlucky near the end, oh, maybe you keep working a couple more years, right? So there's, it's kind of easy to fine tune it and you have a clear target. All right, now that same person retires at 65 because he or she did a great job of investing. Well, a 65 year old man probably has it. 20 plus life expectancy and maybe he has a 60 year old wife who's younger and women live longer may have a 30 year life expectancy and both of those have long tails so you could live to 100 mm -hmm. and there you know you if you're my age um you know if you're sick, but I have no idea whether I'll live to be 80 or 90 or 100. And there's, right, there's no way to know. So, so it's a very difficult problem. Now, the interesting thing is we did have a solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. And it's called an annuity. And this is one of the most interesting things to me. If the people who have old defined benefit pension plans that typically came with an annuity love them, but it no one essentially, no one when they reach retirement with a pot of money puts it all into an annuity. Well, what what's the disconnect? I got involved here locally uh, with the symphony orchestra. Uh, I'm trying to remember when this was. It was pre-pandemic, so <laughs> those are two just you know, they work for everything, it, it, now. right? <laughs> you know, it was pre-pandemic. Um, th the orchestra went on strike. And of course, they're striking about money. But what were the what was the kernel of the issue? The management wanted to switch. They had a 
defined benefit plan. Mm -hmm. Management wanted to switch to a defined contribution plan. The union was resisting that. And I got a couple of friends who are experts in the field to look at what the orchestra was offering. And I thought that if I were a member of that orchestra, I would like what they were offering better. Hmm. And so I ended up meeting with a few members of the orchestra and uh, eventually I, I tell, kept telling them, you know, you could kill one of the world's great symphony orchestras because you're fighting for something that you wouldn't choose <laughs> if you if, if we gave you the choice. So, you know, there's something that isn't lining up here. So, so, um, so we know an annuity spreads your money out forever, but people don't like to buy it um, for various reasons. Um, some annuities are not priced in a very friendly way, so that's kind of easy to understand. But the that's not enough to explain why essentially no one wants to mm -hmm. buy them if if they love them, right? Where's the disconnect? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that uh, people aren't going to do that. And again, they they love that part of Social Security. Yeah, and you know the one. Don't let me get too sidetracked. The one, the one bit of retirement income advice that I'm most confident of is if you can delay claiming Social Security until age 70 because the, the Social, Security, Social Security annuity is indexed. Mm -hmm. Can't buy that on the market. And it's very cheap. Yeah. Uh, if you calculate how much they're charging you uh, by waiting. Uh, now, I've been saying this for a long time, and essentially no one takes this advice. So um, It's gotten better. I, I go on Soapbox rants about how efficient Social Security is, which, you know, as a, economists in the room would probably enjoy this. If you compare it to other products, right, what don't they have? They don't have marketing costs. They don't have R&D costs. They don't have sales costs, right? They, right? Almost everybody, it's like 94% of the working population now pays into it. Well, that's a really good way to keep internal costs down. They have no training, too, if you ever go to a Social Security office, right? But it, <laughs> on, yes. yeah. But the flip side is it makes it very cost-effective to run. So some of the things that make other products and solutions that the market has brought on is like you might go to places and 50 percent of the cost is in distribution well that makes it very hard to compete then against a program that has no distribution costs right well and you know um i i think all the points you're raising are well taken but uh, the other thing about it is you only get to make one decision which is when you Mm -hmm. Start taking money out. One decision. And um, now I will say that uh, they could do a much better job of helping people with that. And, you know, a classic behavioral economics thing is that they have something they call full retirement age. And it used to be 65 and it's gradually going up and I don't know what it is now. It's probably something like 68.2. Now, why, why that? Uh, no, it's less than that, but whatever it is, well, it might be, what, there's nothing. Six and six months right yeah. now. Is that yeah. where yeah. we are? Yeah. Yeah. So 66.7 <laughs> is right. It's not a round number and, and there's nothing magical about it. It, it not right there's no switch that goes on when you hit that age the money you're gonna get just increases smoothly mm -hmm. with how long you wait to start getting it and if you need the money it's better to take some of the money out of your 401k and put it into this 
But anyway, and, that's and I think a digression. to make the choice yeah. potentially worse at age sixty-two, whether you decide to claim or not at sixty-two, you still have to do an administrative function of registering at the Social Security mm-hmm. office. <laughs> And many times that's actually the decision point for people to just go ahead and claim at 62. I got to do this administrative function anyway. And the people helping them do that function is, you know, encouraging them to take it, which is why you saw, I think it was like 50% of people started to claim at 62. Right. Now that some of the education has started to come out, some of the advisors are starting to help sort of optimize Social Security, those, that, that's come down, but it's still a dramatic number of people who take it at age 62 and may not know the implications of doing that, right. potentially. So anyway, what what can we do? Um I think the financial services industry can do a lot in this space. Uh, it It's complicated. And, um, but the, certainly the, the people who have saved up enough to be at least in the, uh, the market for a financial advisor at the mm-hmm. low end of that uh, space um, can have somebody that can help them with it. And I think the rough outline of what makes sense is in, involves my favorite behavioral economic concept, which is mental accounting. So what is mental accounting? Uh, Mental accounting is the way people think about and keep track of money. So an an example is somebody goes to the casino, they win some money. You see, they take the money they've won, they put it in one pocket, and they take the money they brought to gamble and they put it in another pocket. And of course, there's money in their bank account that's in some third pocket pocket uh virtual pocket but then they the money that they won has a name called the house money Mm -hmm. gambling with the house money is a very popular expression even outside of gambling and the notion is that that's okay because it's their money now if you have five hundred dollars in your right pocket and five hundred dollars in your left pocket they will buy just the same amount. Mm-hmm. And so the that's mental accounting. And I'm fascinated with all things mental accounting. So how can we help people with their mental accounting? I'll, I'll give you a story from my father, uh, who's passed away now. But my father was an actuary. So much smarter than me. Very good at math. And uh, he worked for a large insurance company and took an early retirement to start a consulting firm. And he complained to me at some point in his early 80s that he was spending more than his income. And I said, Dad, you know, that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. You know, you're 82. And I said, you know, I'm guessing you have enough to live to say 110 you you're the actuary tell me what are the chances that you're going to live that long so what i got him to do was he had some land i got him to sell part of that land put it into liquid assets put some of that into something very safe and say okay there's layer one yeah and I think if people have, say, two, three years of income that they can count on, then that helps them think about the rest in a calmer way. Now, of course, and then we, you know, we could allocate the rest in, in, in some diversified way, but, uh, the the thing is, right, this is all, it's, why is this behavioral economics? Well, we could achieve the same thing by just saying, well, here, you have a portfolio that is 50% equities and 
twenty uh, percent municipal bonds and ten percent this and five mm-hmm. percent uh, in this very safe thing, but that's all in the abstract. If we put this label on it, that okay, this is this is your uh, emergency money yeah. or this is your living expense money, and of course we can structure that in a way. You know, you can yeah. buy, buy a laddered bond portfolio. I mean, there's lots of ways you can do that in in a more or less sophisticated way. But um, I think that is the structure that's, I think, going to work best. I always tell financial advisors that they're part finance, part shrink. And you, you, you got to get, the clients comfortable with what you're doing and if they have this three years of income bucket and of course some of that can be funded from social security so right so they're getting 40 grand a year or whatever from social security and maybe they need a hundred grand to live on okay so we can start to do the math and now all right what are we going to do with the rest of the money the framing of that Right. And I'll make a very cheesy joke, right? The framing of that on framework is very important, right? But it is, right? It's <laughs> Boo. Uh, p- people like it when I'm cheesy, right? It's good, you know? But uh, the, the framing of it is incredibly important, right? As you said, like it's the same amount of money. It's all fungible. It should be. But how you frame where things came from and where they're going, people then react differently to it. I, I do want to ask you this question, which is do you think that? like in your father's situation, that when people spend money, it goes back to the idea of loss aversion and that spending at some point from a portfolio feels like loss to them. Absolutely. And having to uh, having to sell off some security, that feels painful. Um, and so... You you want you, you you don't want people thinking about it that way, and look the ideal thing is to create what essentially acts as an artificial annuity or a synthetic annuity. I don't want to use the word synthetic because it brings up ba- <laughs> bad memories of um, of my movie career. But uh, right, so but that's what financial engineering can do Mm -hmm. is it can tell people, all right, we're giving you an allowance of a hundred thousand dollars a year. And, you know, I'm just picking a round number and that's, you know, that's what my father was being bugged about is he was spending 120,000 and earning 80,000. And he said, you know, he didn't like being in the red so, you know, that's what uh, essentially I created for him so that he was making more than he was spending and then he was happy. Yeah. And uh, I think there are lots of ways of doing that. And um, and I think there are going to be lots of exciting developments along that front. And I think what you're sometimes referring to is, is maybe this concept of paycheck replacement, right? Yeah, so, exactly. so people are comfortable with what a paycheck is. They have earned a paycheck, you know, for so many years. And the source of the, the paycheck may, may not be as important as the regularity and familiarity of that paycheck coming to them. So designing that system as a, as a paycheck replacement that may be enough to just connect that familiarity without really knowing much of the details behind the scenes. Um, yeah, you know, unless, and unless look, that info is needed. E- I think that's exactly right. And even the mechanics of, so we talked about there's this pot of money that we're setting aside for this. But yeah, have a deposit into the checking account every month. Mm-hmm. W- one thing people have learned, well, most people, most people have learned the basic rule of household budgeting, which is live within your means. Right. So they have you have this 70 year old and somehow they got to be 70 and they did it by spending less than they made or no more. And, you know, with 
homes and cars and things, some exceptions. Now, people who have $20,000 in credit card debt have not learned this lesson. But the people who have and have managed to put some money aside, that's the rule they're used to. So let's let them keep doing that. Now, obviously, there may have to be adjustments. But um, if, if you can give people an allowance, that is going to really calm the nerves. You mentioned your illustrious movie career too right was it the big short that yes. you ran yeah so do, do you the do you know your kevin bacon number it was actually you know how many movies away now are you from kevin bacon two, two. ryan gosling was in a movie uh, with kevin bacon that's good now here's a more <laughs> obscure thing you, there's something called an erdos number okay uh e-r-d-o-s was a famous hungarian mathematician who went around the world, he was crazy. <laughs> he was completely brilliant and crazy, never really had a job. And he would just traipse around. And so he'd show up at MIT and hang out there for a couple of years and prove all of the problems that the mathematicians were working on mm -hmm. and then move on. So he's written papers with hundreds of people. And there's an Erdos number, uh, which is the same way, how many steps away. Uh. And the obscure one is the Bacon Erdos number. <laughs> Five. Five. So okay. I think <laughs> wow. that's, yeah. that's probably my proudest accomplishment. That's good, right? You can... Yeah, you can rest feeling very good about that yeah. in life. Yeah. Well, we'll get here kind of the end, which is, um, you know, I've got one more question than Devin has one too, which is, you know, for yourself, uh, did you ever sit down and kind of write out what is your, what did your like financially free retirement for yourself look like? You know, um, to get there, I'd have to retire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but uh, in fact, I, and my wife and I are finally seriously working with a financial advisor to help us figure out w what what our goals are mm -hmm. for retirement, and uh, we we won't have trouble uh, paying the bills. But uh, what else do we want to do? So um, having a PhD in economics doesn't mean that you know how to make those calculations and especially how to make them in a way that will be reassuring to a wife whose favorite expression is, are you sure? <laughs> so um, so I, I think it's a problem that uh, mm -hmm. it's good to get expert help on and uh, that's, that's what I've decided to do. Well, I'm actually going to sneak in one more question because I'm dying to know. Because you, you earlier you said that you you started out keeping a list of all the dumb things that people <laughs> do. Are you still keeping that list? You don't have to tell us. You know, it is. I just want to know if there's an existence of, of such a list. No, no. The, you know, I've written books now, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, pretty much. I mean, I would say my book, Misbehaving, uh, which is. Uh, a book about behavioral economics that is disguised as a memoir or or the other way around i don't i don't know which way you want to think about it but uh that's basically everything i know so well and that leads nothing left. it leads to the final question which is what what would what do you want to see your legacy be in this particular discipline What's the, what's the story that oh, you want to tell at the end of the day? You know, I, I know what my legacy is, which is uh, young uh, behavioral economists. We started in 1994. We started having what we call summer camp, uh, sponsored by uh, Russell Sage Foundation, which is a foundation in New York that has supported the field. And they gave us a little bit of money and said, do whatever you want with this. And we said, all right, this is what we're going to do. 
and we've been doing it every other year since then. We had a gap because of the pandemic, but it's resuming in July. And the most of the luminaries and coming luminaries in the field spent two weeks with us at one of these camps. And that they they are my legacy. So one day there's going to be a, a Bacon, Erdos, Thaler number somewhere <laughs> amongst these, these future economists. Um, well, if they count so going to summer camp, they're all going to be one. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, Dr. Thaler and Devin, this is a fantastic conversation and you know very insightful. And again, you know, thank you for your time being here with us today, which is always important, right? It's a very precious thing that we have. So whenever you share it with, you know, all the people and the the people that are coming after you, we're all appreciative of it. And uh, you know, thanks for the impact for the millions of people that save more because of your work, and then the millions more that'll be impacted by the positive work of all those you know coming luminaries too. So it's been wonderful, and. And thank you, everybody else, for listening to this episode of the Framework Podcast. Please listen to this quick disclosure. Investment products contain risk and may lose value. There is no guarantee that an investment product will be successful in achieving its objectives. Investors should consult their investment professional prior to making an investment decision. This podcast is brought to you by Carson Group and PIMCO, who are unaffiliated entities. This material contains the opinions of the speakers and is not necessarily the views of Carson Group or PIMCO, and such opinions are subject to change without notice. This podcast may include discussions of investment strategies. These discussions are for illustrative purposes only and may not be appropriate for all investors. The discussions are not based on any particularized financial situation or need and are not intended to be and should not be construed as a forecast, research, investment advice, or recommendation for any specific PIMCO or other strategy, product, or service. Individuals should consult their own financial advisors to determine the most appropriate allocations for their financial situation, including their investment objectives, time frame, risk tolerance, savings, and other investments. PIMCO does not provide legal or tax advice. Further, this seminar is not intended to provide specific legal, tax, or other professional advice in this podcast. For a comprehensive review of your personal situation, always consult with a tax or legal advisor. The discussion herein is general in nature and is provided for informational purposes only. There is no guarantee as to its accuracy or completeness. Any tax statements contained herein are not intended or written to be used and cannot be relied upon or used for purpose of avoiding penalties imposed by the Internal Revenue Service or state and local tax authorities. Individuals should consult their own legal and tax counsel as to matters discussed herein and before entering into any estate planning, trust, investment, retirement, or insurance arrangement. <music>